Today we're going to continue in our series called This is the Gospel. So last week we kicked this off. Barry did a beautiful job of kind of painting the picture of what the gospel is. And sometimes when we approach this topic of the gospel, we approach it and we kind of come into the story halfway through it. It's like coming into a movie that, you know, halfway through and not really fully understanding and grasping the beauty and the intricacies of what Jesus has done. And so he painted this picture. And I don't know, does anybody remember what the four words were? He used? Anybody here last week? Creation. Creation, that was one of them. Hey, first service got it pretty quick. Fall. Fall. Rest, rescue and restoration. That was pretty good. You guys get a, I'll give you a B. That was pretty good. Hopefully you remember what I talk about today. Um, I'm just, I'm just giving you a hard time. Anyways, we're going to continue this topic of the gospel. So when we were kind of game planning the service and what we were going to talk through in the next couple weeks, um, this week was kind of centered around the gospel and me, right? Like, what is the impact of the gospel on my life, right? Because the reality is this, is sometimes if you've been around in the church any amount of time, you might get into this mentality that, like, you've graduated from the gospel or something, like, you know, we've learned that. That's kind of like kiddie stuff, elementary stuff. Like, we did that the first day I was in the church, and we went through this class and did all these things, and now it's time for me to graduate onto deeper theological thoughts and deeper things of the Bible, and we kind of just leave the gospel back here. I do this sometimes. It's almost as if we uh, equate it to, like, some elementary thing that we graduate from. But what we see in Scripture is that the gospel is not merely elementary. It's foundational. Truly, the gospel is what we are to build our lives upon. Truly, it's the lens in which we see Jesus rightly. And so if we are to do business with this question of how is the gospel impacting my life, we must first do business with what we believe. Do we really believe the gospel? Do we really believe that what Jesus did and what he said about himself was true? Because here's the facts. What you believe directly impacts the way that you live, right? A.W. Tozer said, said it this way. He's an old dead guy who said a lot of really good things. Um, he said, what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. It's true. What you think about God, what you believe to be true about God is the most important thing about you because it's from that belief that you live, that impacts the way that you live for God and live from God. The gospel is not only a foundational truth we're to build our lives on, but it's the lens in which we see God rightly. And so to help better understand this, uh, obviously I wear glasses, right? They're actually pretty dirty right now. That's kind of gross. Um, I haven't worn glasses all my life. Unfortunately, my eyesight has gotten worse over the years. And you know, I was even talking to Matt Hammersley last week. He was praying over me. He's one of the elders here. He was praying over my back because I was having some back issues. And I'm just like, I'm not even 30 years old yet. And I'm having back problems. My sight is going. Like, my knees crack when I stand up. I'm like, people are telling me all the time, like, you're way too young to be experiencing that. And I'm like, I agree fully. I can't wait for the next 30 years of my life. <laughs> right? Uh, but pretty new to this glasses thing. So I can remember before I left for my first year of Bible college, I got an eye exam. And, um, you know, I won't tell you where I went and got my eye exam or eyes examined and got these glasses. I'll never go back. Anyways, um, so I can remember going in there and they did the tests and we figured out what lenses I needed and I got to pick out the frames I wanted and it was awesome. And so I was leaving to move down to Florida and so they were gonna send them to me and um, I don't know if there's any college students in the room or maybe you have gone to college and you remember just how awesome it was to receive mail at school. Um, so I was, I was excited about that. I moved down to Florida, I'll get some mail. Uh, yeah, I was excited about that. Um, and so, you know, I moved down to Florida, and I can remember coming back into where we were living at the time, and I uh, had a little pink slip in my mailbox, and I got super excited. I ran to the desk like a little, little boy on Christmas morning, and uh, got my package, and it was my glasses, and I went up to my room, and, and it's almost like it was the unveiling. I'm like, ah, oh, here we go. These frames are going to be perfect, exactly what I wanted. Lo and behold, I opened the box. The frames I chose were not in there. I don't know how else to describe what they were. If you've ever seen the movie Despicable Me, 
like the villain guy that wears the orange jumpsuit and has these, the huge, like CeeLo Green glasses. Like, I don't know if you know who that is, but like thick, like huge. I did not choose those. And they weren't only the wrong frames, they were bifocals. Like, <laughs> clearly the wrong prescription. Not what I ordered, not what I needed to correct my sight, right? And, you know, I tried them on and they, Obviously, my prescription isn't super, super crazy, and so I tried to wear them for a little bit to see if they'd work, and they did not correct my vision. They made my vision blurrier. I couldn't make things out well. I was getting headaches and suffering through this, and I was so upset about this. And here's the thing about that, though, is that our beliefs are often like those lenses, and like those lenses that I got, the bifocals, had a negative effect on the way that I experienced life and saw things, Oftentimes, our experiences, our circumstances, things that happen around us tend to skew, distort, and contort the way that we see things, right? Maybe you've suffered through a trauma. Maybe there's a loss that you're dealing with right now, a diagnosis that you just got. I don't know what it might be, but it's persuading you to believe something about God that's just not true, right? Has anybody suffered with that, dealt with that? Like, this thing happened, so there's no way that God loves me, right? So-and-so just passed away, and there's no way that if God really loved me, if he was really there for me, this would have happened. And so our circumstances, our experiences tend to persuade us to believe something about God that just is truly not true. And if we want to understand what the impact of the gospel is on our lives, we must first do business with what we believe, Because it's from our belief that we live. So we're asking the question, what are you believing to be true about God this morning? What are you believing to be true about God? Because what you think about God, what you believe to be true about God, is the most important thing about you. And so, in essence, kind of today, we're going to do an eye exam. Are you ready? I'm not an eye doctor. Jesus is a way better eye doctor than I ever will be. The gospel is a way better prescription than any glasses that I could wear. And so we're going to bring those old lenses of those false beliefs, maybe those lies that we've been just riddled with and thought about, and we're going to ask the Spirit of God to illuminate to us, to remind us of the truth of the gospel. It's this truth that Paul prayed that the church in Ephesus would be rooted in and grounded in, in Ephesians chapter 3. Three gospel truths that we should root ourselves in and ground ourselves to, to constantly return to, to, in order for us to see Jesus rightly so that we can believe the truth. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 says this, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, according to the riches of his glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God And he shifts and says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And the church said, Amen. Here we see three gospel truths that Paul is praying the church would be rooted in that will shape the very essence of our lives and be the true and right lens in which we see and experience God. Are you ready? The first promise, the first gospel truth that we are to root ourselves in and be grounded in is this, is that the gospel promises the presence of God. The gospel promises the presence of God. What does he say? That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Friends, this is a reminder that the Spirit of God dwells within the children of God. And this may, you may be like, Elijah, I already know that. But we need to constantly come back to this truth and be reminded that God's presence has not left us. He says, he said in John chapter 15 that Jesus was going to send a helper, that he was gonna send the spirit of God to bear witness about him, that this was the seal of the gospel, the seal of the Holy Spirit, that he was gonna send his helper to live 
in us, to do life with us and to intercede and, and to bear witness about him. Paul prays that the church would be grounded in this reality, that they would live in this reality, that God is with us. So I don't know what you're believing this morning about God. Maybe something happened. Maybe you're struggling to make ends meet. I don't know what's happening in your life right now, but it's persuading you to believe this, that God has left you. We're honest. Maybe we struggle with that a little bit. Maybe you think God is not present. He's left you and it has everything to do that with what you have done and whatever is going on in your life. And so he kind of just gave up on you and walked out. But the gospel Center us, centers us around the truth that God is with us. His word actually says that he promises never to leave us or forsake us. We need to root ourselves and ground ourselves in this reality that God is with us. The second gospel truth that, we are, that Paul prayed that they would be rooted and grounded in is this, is that the gospel proclaims the love of God. So not only does the gospel promise the presence of God, but the gospel proclaims the love of God. What does he say? To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. He prays that the church would be rooted in this fact that God loves you. And not only does, not only that we would know his love that we would comprehend just how big and how wide and how deep and how high it is. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter eight. He says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Then he shifts to something that he's persuaded of, a belief that he has. Look at what he believes to be true. He says, for I am sure I believe that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, that's good news. That's good news for us today, that there is nothing that we can face, there is nothing that we can do that would ever separate us from the love of God. Of God. Is anybody thankful for that truth this morning? The gospel reminds us that not only just how much God loves us, but how secure we can be in that love. And let me just say this. This may seem cliche or something, but I feel like it just needs to be said. Like, God loves you. I don't know if people tell you that enough, or maybe you haven't been reminded of that for a long time, or I don't know. Like, you just need to, God loves you. He sees you in your doubt. He sees you in your unbelief. He sees you in your sinfulness. And he still loves you. We just sang about it. That the, the invitation is there for us to come to the altar, that his arms are open wide. He sees you in your dirt, in the mire, in the mess of your life, and he loves you anyways. God's love for you is still abundant. His grace for you is still sufficient. His mercies for you are still new. Like those promises have not run out because of what you're facing in your life right now. That's good news, friends. So not only does the gospel proclaim the love of God, or not only does the gospel promise the presence of God, but thirdly, the gospel displays the power of God. The gospel displays the power of God. Look at what he says. He says, to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. Paul points out that the one he is praying to, Jesus, he's pretty powerful. If you need a reminder of just how powerful he is, he's able to do far more than we could ever think up. He's able to do far more than we could ever imagine, far more than we could ever ask for. Like, when I think about that, I mean, honestly, it doesn't take too much to be, you know, much more powerful than me. Like, I'm not really all that powerful, but God is all powerful. And the gospel displays that and proves that to us, that he is powerful. He is way bigger, way stronger, way mightier than I am. Look at how Paul describes him in Colossians chapter one. He says, but for by him, all things were created. Right there, he already trumps me. Right there, he already trumps you. All things were created by him. 
Like Jesus already wins. Like the, he already has a leg up on us. Anyways, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. It's a pretty powerful God. Look at what the writer of Hebrews says about him. He says, and Jesus is the radiance of his, and he is the radiance of his glory being Jesus and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. Then look what he says. He says, and when he had made purifications of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Like, think about that. He says, when he had made purifications of sin, sins, he sat down at the right hand of the Father, or at the right hand of the majesty on high. Like, the writer of Hebrews is kind of paraphrasing a little bit just how awesome this work is. Like, Jesus had just gotten done kicking Satan in the teeth, right, destroying and defeating sin and death. Like, he was dead for a little bit. He kind of was hanging out in the grave, got up, accomplished literally the greatest rescue there ever has been, like ever, and what does he do? He goes home and he sits down. Like when I accomplish something, like for instance, like late, the last couple weeks, we've been working really hard on our bathroom and um, against my will, I'd, it's home ownership, right? Things happen. And so, you know, I finished the bathroom and I got this done and I felt really accomplished about that. And I want people to come over and see it and see my work. And I want my wife to, to build me up and, and gloat about the great work I've done and all these different things. And the last thing I want to do is separate myself from people and go and sit down. But what does Jesus do? He does his great and mighty work, displays his power and fullness and goes home and sits down. And I think it's important for us to think about that because if you're like me, sometimes I look at God and I'll be dealing with something or a trauma comes up into my mind and I start thinking these things about God and it brings me to this place of thinking God must not care. Almost, I don't know if you've ever seen the show The Goldbergs, um, but it's a classic like family sitcom like, and the, the dad is depicted as this guy who, you know, he's kind of bigger, kind of, kind of lazy, I would say, works at a furniture shop, and when he comes home, he sits down in his recliner, you know, he has his beer, and he can't be bothered by anybody. Like, the kids, everything is going crazy around him. His kids are acting all crazy, and he can't be bothered, right? And sometimes, if we're honest, the beliefs we have about God tend to lead us into this picture that God is like this dad from the Goldbergs. Like, He's, in his, he's on his throne in heaven. He's separated himself from us. He can't be bothered. He doesn't actually care about us. He doesn't actually see what's going on. Like if he actually loved me, if he actually cared about what was going on in my life, he would get up off his throne and do something about it, right? Like I can remember growing up and hearing that in my house. Like my mom saying, Mike, do something about this, right? Right? And we do this to God a lot. Because our experiences, our circumstances have persuaded us to believe that God actually is not with us. He doesn't love us. That his promises are not true for us. That he's this father who has removed himself from us, can't be bothered by anything that's going on in our lives and doesn't have the time of day for us. But what we need to remember is this. God didn't need to sit down. Like, God didn't go home and sit down because he needed a break, right? Like, he didn't go home because he's tired and he's lazy and, you know, not interested, right? This picture in Hebrews is probably the, is a beautiful picture of the power of God. Jesus and his loving kindness came down to this earth, lived a perfect life, suffered ridicule and was spit on, went to the cross and died the most horrific death, went to the grave and displayed his power by coming out of that grave, defeating sin and death. And he goes and sits down and he's not sitting down because he needs a break. Him, this verse proves us that 
He has it under control. He sat down because he had finished the work. He had accomplished what he set out to do. He finished the job. In other words, he's got it under control. And life may be preaching at you that he doesn't, that he doesn't have it under control. There's no way that God has it under control. Does he see the way that our world is right now? Does he see the world, the way that my world is right now? And so we get into this rut where we don't think that God is in control. He can't handle what happens in our lives. And so then we start killing ourselves trying to fulfill that role of, that God is supposed to fulfill for us. We become the gods of our universe and say, we need to take matters in, into our own hands. And we start working and filling our lives and filling our schedules and thinking that if we just do, 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 and do more and fill our schedules more, that maybe things would be okay. We become the gods of our own universe because we have believed this lie that God can't handle what is going on in our lives. Maybe it's the flip with your sin. You start, you start going to church and reading your Bible and doing all these things and thinking that if I just do all of these things and check the boxes, that maybe that will make me righteous and maybe I'll earn the forgiveness of God, right? It's the same thing. It's the same reaction. We're taking matters into our own hands and saying, I'm going to be the God of this universe. I'm going to dictate whether I'm forgiven. I'm going to dictate whether I have peace. I'm going to dictate everything. Because we believed this lie that God can't actually handle it. And here's what the gospel reminds us of. That God didn't just sit down because he was lazy. He sat down because he finished what he needed to do. He finished the job. His work was final. And friends, some of us, some of us need to take a break we need to sit down and realize that God is powerful, that God is in control, and that he is able to handle everything that life has to throw at us. Guys, God is able to handle it. The world will continue to spin. We can take a break and rest in that fact that God is in control. He is powerful enough to handle it. So how are we doing? Doing all right? How's the eye exam? <laughs> we need to do business with this. What are, we, what are we believing to be true about God? Because what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. If we want to answer the question, how is the gospel impacting our lives, we must first understand what we're believing to be true about God. And you might be here and you're suffering loss or you're dealing with a diagnosis that you didn't expect or maybe you're struggling to make ends meet. Maybe you're riddled by shame and guilt and it's causing you to question God. Maybe you find yourself saying, God doesn't actually love me. God isn't really there for me. If he loved me that much, you know, my loved one would still be here. That loved one wouldn't have passed away. My spouse wouldn't have walked out on me. I wouldn't be struggling to put food on my table. I wouldn't be riddled with shame and guilt. And friends, look right at me because I love you enough to say this. God's godness and God's faithfulness is not dependent upon our circumstances. Sorry. God is still God. And the gospel is still good news. His grace is still sufficient. His love is still abounding. God is not any less God because of the circumstances that I face, because of the experiences that I've had. It doesn't change his faithfulness, his sovereignty, and his love for me. That's good news. I just got to say this too. Like if you're here and the spirit of God is welling something up in you and allowing you to see like, yeah, maybe I am claiming this belief that God isn't really for me, that he doesn't actually love me, that his grace has actually run out for me. Like I want you to hear this. Like you wrestling with those things doesn't make you a failure. It doesn't say that you're a bad Christian, Right? Like you walking out of this room, I pray that you wouldn't walk out of this room and think, well, okay, well, I need to go, you know, 
read the Bible in one sitting and I need to do all of these things because, no, like, God loves you despite the wrestling. Like, there's a passage in the gospel of Jesus was doing this thing for, for this family and the father says, God, I, Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief. Like, you can hear this truth and you can say, yes, I want to believe that, but it's butting heads with this other belief in you that is just preaching to you and persuading you that there's no way that that could be true. And so the reality is, it doesn't make you a failure, but you also can't will yourself out of these beliefs. You need, we need the Spirit of God to come in and do a deep work to root out these lies and root out these beliefs that we have been imprisoned by for so, so long and to replace, replenish us with the truth of the gospel. That's the power of the Spirit of God and he is interested in doing that because he's not just the good news of Jesus that he put on flesh and bone, that he came down from his home in heaven to rescue me, to rescue a wretched, sinful, lost person like myself, like you, to die in my place, to rise from the dead. The good news of that is not just to change my eternity, to give me a new home in heaven. Jesus is not just interested in redirecting your eternity. He is interested in transforming your heart, renewing your mind, and allowing you to step into life that he has planned for you, that he has willed for you, a life that is abundant. He's far more interested about who you're becoming, not solely interested about where you're going. And this is the beauty of the gospel. And friends, that work of rooting out those unbelief or those false beliefs, those lies can start right today. Honestly, my prayer has been, as I've been thinking through this and praying through this, is that the Spirit of God would just move in this place and illuminate in us areas that we, you know, maybe we're just believing some false things about God. Maybe there's a past trauma that's happened to you. I, this is happening, this is happening even to me right now. God is doing a deep work in me and rooting out, sorry, unbelief and, and false beliefs that have just riddled my life for so long and hindered me from really seeing Jesus rightly. So my prayer for you this morning is that the Spirit of God would, can, would begin to do that good work in you, illuminating those lies and reminding you of the gospel. And friends, this is the thing. The invitation to believe is always going to be extended. Like the invitation to believe is not just one time that happened over here a long time ago and we kind of move on. Like the invitation to believe that Jesus died for you, that he loves you, that his grace is sufficient for you is extended to you day after day, hour after hour. It will never run out and you can accept that today. And so I wanna give you a moment this morning just to respond and so I wanna give you time just to kind of bow your heads. I'm gonna invite you to do that now. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Even if you're watching online, I give you an opportunity to do that as well. Just to do business with this. What are you believing to be true about God? And as you hear the gospel truths, these things that the gospel displays, the power, the love, and the presence of God, and you want to believe that, but there's something rooted in your heart that is blocking you and hindering you from really seeing and experiencing Jesus in the fullness of his glory. Friend, I, I, I plead with the Spirit of God that he would just set you free from that this morning. You don't have to leave with those lenses this morning. You can leave those at the altar this morning and leave with the right and correct lenses of the gospel to see Jesus for who he is and what he has done and to experience him in his fullness and in his glory. So take a moment and just ask the Spirit of God to come in and show you what that belief might be. The Spirit of God, what is it that I'm believing right now that does not match up with what we just talked about? And just ask him to help you to take a step of faith today, to choose to believe that what Jesus says about himself and about you is true. I'm gonna pray for us and as you're kind of just 
mulling in silence. I'm gonna invite the prayer team actually to come forward. And um, if there's any members of the prayer team, they can come forward now. And maybe the spirit of God has been speaking to you and stirring in your heart. And you just wanna tell somebody about that. The prayer team is here. They would love to talk to you. Me and Pastor Barry will be here afterwards as well. If you want to grab one of us, we'd love just to talk to you about what God is kind of just welling up inside of you and just pray over you. We also want you to know that this, the altar is open. If you want to come and kind of just leave metaphorically those beliefs that you've walked in here with, that God isn't for you, that he doesn't actually love you, if you want to just leave that here, you can do that and leave here with the truth of the gospel, that he loves you. He is with you. He is strong enough to handle whatever life has to throw at us. If you're watching online, I want to give you an opportunity. You can actually do that in the chat as well. And you can, you can request to pray with one of us pastors. And we would love just to pray with you. And so you can do that in the chat as well. But I'm going to pray for us now. And um, then we can, uh, we can go. But God, we come before you now. We just say thank you for your love for us. God, that you saw us in our sinfulness, you saw us in our brokenness, and God, you, in your perfect loving kindness, chose to get up out of your throne room and come down to this earth and put flesh and bone on to walk among us, to be with us, and to do something about it. God, we rejoice over the truth that you went to the cross and, and, and died that death for us. You took on our sinfulness. You took on the penalty of our sin and took it with you to the grave. But God, we also rejoice and say hallelujah and thank you that you did not stay dead, that we can rejoice in the fact that you got up out of that grave conquering sin and death once and for all. And we thank you for the invitation that you extend to us over and over and over again to believe again. Help us, God, in our unbelief, in the times in which trauma and past experiences and circumstances are screaming at us that you don't love us, that you don't actually care for us, that you have left us a long time ago. God, please help us to return to the gospel, to see you rightly, to pick up the lenses of the gospel, to see you for who you are and what you've done, to see how you truly feel about about us, to see how you really see us, and may that just root itself in our hearts and impact our lives forever, that we would just walk in that reality, God, that we would return to the well of the gospel time and time again to be refueled and refilled. God, we thank you that we can claim that your grace is sufficient for us still that your love is still abounding, that it has not run out, that your mercies are still new, and that you yourself are with us. We love you. We thank you for the work that you're doing even right now, and we pray as we leave this place that you would encourage us and empower us to step into, step out of these doors and step into the life that you have called us to, the abundant life with you. We give you all the praise and all the glory and pray these things in your name. Amen.